You're listening to the voice of Nassau Community College, 90.3 WHPC. My name is Bill McIntyre, and it's time for this week's Long Island News, the show that talks to newsmakers and other important people from Nassau and Suffolk County that matter to Long Island and Long Islanders like you. So each week we'll have a conversation about issues that affect all of us. I live on Long Island just like you, and I want to know more about the people making the big decisions that affect all of us. And this week, we're going to continue our conversation with those individuals who've declared their candidacy for Long Island's congressional seats in the 2024 election. Well, today, my guest is Laura Gillen, who is the Democratic candidate running in the 4th District, the seat currently held by Republican Anthony D'Esposito, setting up a rematch of the 2022 election in the district. And as a reminder, Ms. Gillen held the title of Hempstead Town Supervisor when she was elected back in 2017. Well, welcome to this week's Long Island News. Bill, thank you so much for having me on. <laughs> Thanks for being here. I know uh, when you're running for office, you've got a lot on your calendar, I'm sure. So thanks for taking the time. Glad to be here. Um, all right, just for, for giggles, uh, why don't you reintroduce yourself to the audience, uh, some people that may not know. Uh, sure. So I'm Laura Gillen. Uh, as Bill mentioned, I'm the former Hempstead Town Supervisor. I was the first Democrat in 112 years to be elected to that position. Um, you know, I grew up in this district. I spent most of my life living in the town of Hempstead and in New York's 4th Congressional District. I have deep roots here. My grandfather was an Italian immigrant uh, who came to this country seeking a better life. He settled in the district, raised his family here, got a job actually in the town of Hempstead as a sanitation worker. And in two generations, we saw he saw his family move from the back of a garbage truck to the corner CEO's office when I got elected to be town supervisor. Um, so I really care passionately about preserving the quality of life for people who live here and making sure that those opportunities that were presented to my grandfather and to my family are still there for other families uh, here living in New York's 4th Congressional District. And uh, by background, I'm also a, a lawyer. I practice law at both at a big Manhattan law firm and on Long Island in the district for a number of years until I became supervisor. Also uh, did a lot of volunteer work in this district. In my youth, I volunteered at South Nassau Hospital. I volunteered and worked at Camp Anchor, which is a town camp for special needs children and adults. I volunteered for GMHC. And then I went to Calcutta and volunteered for Mother Teresa uh, and took care of people in her home for the dying when I was in my 20s. Wow. You've been around. <laughs> As we mentioned about your running for the election, uh, it's setting up to kind of become like a rematch of, of last year's election. Uh, we looked at it. Uh, Mr. D'Esposito uh, won by roughly 10,000 votes. So that's approximately 52% to 48%. Um, what do you think is different this time around? Or do you think that this was close enough that to go for another shot? Sure. I, I, think, um, I think that there's a lot of di differences between the 24 race and the 22 race. First of all, uh, I'm get, I got into the race a lot earlier. Last election cycle, uh, we got in very late because of the unexpected retirement of Kathleen Rice. Um, so I put together a new team. But uh, the big difference is now Anthony D'Esposito can't talk out of both sides of his mouth as he did in the last election and say one thing to one crowd and another thing to a different crowd. Now Anthony D'Esposito has a record. Um, he has a record of voting uh, in extreme fashion with his MAGA cronies. Um, he's voted to suspend reproductive rights for women in the military. He's voted um, to cut, make cuts to federal law enforcement. Um, he's voted to make cuts to other uh, programs such as uh, food programs for, for the needy in our district. Mm -hmm. um, so now he has a record and I intend to hold him to the record. I also think that um, as Roe was the overturning of Roe was kind of new in the 22 election cycle. Now we've seen state and local governments take a hard turn to the right, um, putting in draconian bans on women, women's reproductive freedom. Mm -hmm. And I think that issue will resonate even more strongly this election cycle. And be, as I said, um, he has shown that he's anti choice D'Esposito, anti choice Anthony, and we intend to hold him to the, his record. Mm. Okay, well said. Um, yeah, it seems uh, it seems as though we're on a bullet train to the Middle Ages, um, as far as some of the legislation that you see. I I, I don't get it. I also don't get uh, Nassau County or Suffolk County actually has the highest concentration of veterans in the country. Right. And yet New York 
uh, in the last big election, New York was all Republican. And the rest of the country seemed to go Democrat. There were reactions to the uh, Roe v. Wade things in the middle of the country where they, they kind of made sure that negative legislation can't go much farther. Um, I, I never expected to see this at my age. And, you know, you always think things are getting better and better. But we are taking giant steps back to, I guess, when things were great, 1950. <laughs> it, it, it is. For some, I, it wasn't so great. But. I, I say to folks, I never thought that my daughters could have less rights than my mother, my 80 something year old mother enjoyed most of her life. Yeah. Um, so we are taking steps backwards. And that's what we have. That's why this election is so important. Uh, and, you know, you mentioned it, it, the choice issue really resonating in other places. It didn't seem to resonate as much here. I think there was perhaps a sense of security for people living in in states where they had laws protecting mm. women's access to reproductive freedoms that they would be safe. Um, however, now every single presidential contender on the Republican side said that they would favor a national abortion ban. And so now I think people are realizing even if you're in a state where you have state law protecting you, a national law will mean you're not protected. Mm -hmm. And so and and this year we're going to have the ERA amendment on the ballot as well. So I think that this issue will be front and center uh, for voters in this district. And let's not forget the we're on the right side of the issue. The majority of Americans uh, favor women's right to reproductive choices and to uh, have a right to choose. Yeah. Uh, and the majority of Americans don't want the federal government in their doctor's office making medical decisions for them. I just, I, I just, it, 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 I try to think of, you know, when uh, a politician comes out with an idea like this, who's applauding that? I, I, I would like to identify, though. I, I don't know who, how can you say this is a good thing? We went back 50 years. Well, we can start with um, the Speaker of the House, Mike Johnson, who Anthony oh. D'Esposito voted for, who wants to roll back women's reproductive rights. He wants to roll back LGBTQ rights. He wants to cut Social Security and Medicaid. Uh, this is this is who Anthony D'Esposito supports. This is why he cannot be reelected, because he has shown that he is, he is a follower, not a leader, and he'll just go along with whatever his party says. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think that's uh, the, the biggest issue that we have going forward is uh, how do you have people in Congress that were sworn to protect the Constitution and are obviously not doing that? And me, I, I don't, I don't mean it's kind of hidden. They're obviously not doing that. Um, I, and okay with spreading conspiracy theories that have been debunked, like the election was stolen. Oh <laughs> boy, boy! You know, I. I've tried to, I, I'm usually very nice and, and when I get some of the candidates in, but there are some people I wanted to ask that as a direct question. Um, and and I, I, I didn't want it to sound like I was, you know, because it's a, it's a valid question. Do you believe an election was stolen? Let's start there. Because if you do, I don't think there's much left for the conversation. Um, you know, what are we reading? There's so many people have been propagandized that we really don't know what's true and what's not. It's a real big problem in politics this, these yeah. days because there are a few consequences. Last cycle, I saw Anthony D. D Esposito put out blatantly false mailers, defamatory, libelous mailers, um, and yeah, yeah, he got away with it because yeah. if you sue him. By the time you get to court, the election's over. Mm. So there's a real problem with. Um, Finding out voters knowing what the truth is, um, and it's something that we have to we have to fight back against that. Yeah. I have a lot of questions about that. I mean, how many frivolous lawsuits are you allowed to file before a judge turns to you and says no more? Well, I mean, we're getting into the, an area of the law here. If you do file a blatantly frivolous lawsuit, an attorney could be sanctioned for doing that. You're listening to this week's Long Island News on the voice of Nassau Community College, 90.3 WHPC. My name is Bill McIntyre, and my guest today is Ms. Laura Gillen, former town of Hempstead supervisor, who is running for Congress as a Democrat in New York's 4th Congressional District in next year's election. Are there going to be any direct, like, debates, you think, in, in the election? Do you I, th I think there happen? will be, you know, closer to the actual election. Last year, Newsday hosted um, a debate uh, That's right, yes. And the women League of Women Voters usually does a debate, but there was there were some scheduling conflicts, so it didn't happen last cycle. But I imagine they'll they'll put out dates a little bit earlier this time. And I think that was also not really just their fault, but the fact that there was such a late primary, mm. um, they didn't even know what was going to happen, who uh, the candidates were going to be. Well, at least on our side, you know, Diaz Esposito did not have a primary. Yeah, yeah. 
Um, it, you know, it's a, it's funny because you know we. I always tell the listening audience that you know the politics you should be interested in is your local stuff. Everybody, of course, is fixated on the national thing, and only because it's so bizarre. I think is where the fixation comes from. Particularly now, most of us have not seen this kind of circus in a long time. We've seen foolish things, you know, and, but this is the whole atmosphere is just, you know, get your cotton candy and hang out by the side because the peanut gallery's got there's quite a show going on. Um, but anyway, so now uh, it's it's not your seat, but obviously uh, we we can't talk about Long Islanders in Congress these days without talking about George Santos. Um, and we should state, and I'll bring it up, uh, we're taping the show on a Friday morning. Uh, the vote to expel him is scheduled to happen imminently. If it does, we'll be certain to bring you that news. Um, so we're taping this before the result. But what's your opinion on what's been going on? Well, look, the fact that George Santos got elected in the first place, that he was purportedly vetted and um, the NASA GOP chose to run him as a candidate um, is shocking. I mean, we're at a system where they, we're at a point in our um, country where the Gallup poll, recent Gallup poll said confidence in Congress is at an all time low. There's never been less confident in the institution of Congress. Uh, and how could it not be when you have people like George Santos um, serving in office. George Santos is has demonstrated that he's a compulsive liar. Um, yet Anthony D'Esposito chose to run with him. He had no problem raising money with him, doing campaign stops with him, um, sharing a treasurer with him who's now in, in trouble with the yeah. FEC. That was all fine. The only time George Santos was not okay to Anthony D'Esposito is when he got caught and when he was revealed to be a fraudster. However, that happened early in 2023. Right. But we're only at this point where he might be expelled now. Um, so so the Republicans really don't care. Je Anthony D'Esposito said in Newsday today, he said, I never want to talk about George Santos again after this. Of course he doesn't, mm -hmm. because as I said, he was perfectly happy to run with him. He was perfectly happy to raise money with him. And yeah. because of the way that George Santos speaks and the lie after lie he tells, I think the average person could unmask George Santos within like five to ten questions as being a liar. Um, Anthony D'Esposito's entire campaign last time was like, vote for me. I'm a detective. Well, he's, he has shown that he's he either knew or he's a pretty poor detective if he couldn't figure out that his running mate that he ran around taking pictures with and raising money with was a, a fraudster. Um, so, so I think that it's a stain on our democracy. It's, this, it's, it's an embarrassment. It's a national and global embarrassment to the voters of Long Island that this is who they put forward. It should yeah. be an embarrassment to the Nassau GOP <laughs> that they put him forward. And I think that uh, I think that it will still continue to be an issue into the 24 cycle. Yeah, well, I think that it, one of, I mean, I always talk about optics on the show because I think most people watching things, you can only uh, kind of discern what's going on by what it looks like. I come from a time when if, if it looked bad, you didn't do it. That rule is gone by the wayside. And if it looks bad now, most people, well, we don't care. And that's evident with the Donald Trump stuff. I mean, the guy has done just about everything on the, the negative side of the, that you can think of. And nobody cares. Um, it was obviously McCarthy that kept George Santos in Congress sir, simply for the vote. Exactly. I'm wondering, well, what would change now if George Santos gets kicked out of Congress? Would they hold a special election? Well, it's up to the governor to call a special election, but I do anticipate that uh, the governor will call a special election. Right. And how would that, let's just say a Democrat got elected to that spot, how would that tip the, the, the power balance in Congress? Well, it would be one more vote on on the Democratic side that we don't have right now. Right. Um, and so, you know, that whoever wins in a special election will have to run again in November. But it's a vote that we'll have for this for this session of Congress. Right. Right. Well, we just got news that uh, Sandra Day O'Connor apparently just passed away. Oh. Um, yeah, that was uh, when when she was on the Supreme Court. There, I mean, there are so many things. It's almost anywhere you look. Now, we got trouble. Well, how, yes. How do we, uh, w I mean, look, we're holding another election. We're just, you know, we're going on like it's uh, just a regular ride and it's just another day. But it's not. The, the, 
you know, I look at it like, a, uh, let's just say Congress was a loaf of bread. We got a lot of bad yeast. Well, that makes the whole loaf bad. It, there aren't just a few pockets of something that's wrong. The whole institution is becoming tainted. And like you said, the, you know, approval rating is through the floor. Um, how do we fix that? How, how, what's the first step to... So I think you, I'm really sorry to learn the news about Sandra Day O'Connor. Obviously, she's a trailblazer. She's yeah, a leader for many girls who dreamed of going into law. Um, and I think just thinking about her and thinking about the Supreme Court that she, that she served on, um, you know, the Supreme Court was one of the more, more revered mm -hmm. institutions in our country. Um, and there's stories about um, Sonia Sotomayor, who's definitely more to the left. She was actually my, my law professor at NYU. Uh. Um, and her, her great friendship with uh, Justice Scalia, who is mm -hmm. the po politically the diametric opposite of yeah. her. Yeah. But there was respect. There was respect for the other side. Mm -hmm. um, and now we've seen the erosion of the confidence in what was once the the, the, the one branch of government that you could trust because right. it was supposed to be people with with appointments that they didn't have to worry about the politics of the day where they could just focus on what is the correct application of this law. Mm -hmm. And you had people there who were not there to serve any political agenda, but just to serve the people. That should be true in the houses of Congress as well. Mm -hmm. Um we need to elect people who are not partisan hacks, who won't just go along to get along. Um, I have demonstrated as town of Hempstead supervisor, I was the first Democrat in 112 years. They were not happy to see me there. I had a Republican board uh, that, you know, had four votes so they could undo anything I did. Uh, one of those people who would often try to obstruct me was Anthony D'Esposito. Uh, I went into the town. I had bipartisan support when I got elected. You may recall Bruce Blakeman actually endorsed me in that race. Um and I thought I was going to like really have a great bipartisan government there because there's no Democratic or Republican way to run a town. There's just right. a good way and a bad way. Mm -hmm. um, so all my initiatives that I put forward were good government initiatives. And again, I felt I faced obstruction that was shocking because when you want to refinance the town's debt to save millions of dollars uh, for taxpayers – Everybody should be on board, but mm. it was a struggle to get things on board because they didn't want me to get credit for it. However, even under those challenging circumstances, I managed to get things done. Whether with a carrot or a stick, I got things done in the town of Hempstead. That's the kind of person that you need in Congress. Someone who will, who will, knows that their agenda is to represent the people of their districts. And it's not just Democrats, it's Republicans, it's people who aren't affiliated with any political party, it's everybody in your district. What do the people in your district need, and how can you reach across the aisle to get things done? Right now, our problem is everything has become so partisan and so divided, um, and there aren't people who are willing to buck their own party. Again, Anthony D'Esposito is putting on this whole political theater act right now that he's going to throw out a member of his of uh, his mm. caucus by throwing out George Santos, but like, let's let's call a spade a spade here. Again, perfectly fine to r run with him. Perfectly fine to raise money with him. Perfectly fine to like let this drag out as long as possible. Mm. Um, his real concern about George Santos being unethical and doing all the bad things that he did is about as genuine as George Santos's resume. Yeah, right. Well, you said before that the Republican Party vetted him. Uh, I don't think they did. <laughs> well, I, I think it would have been pretty, uh, you know, transparent that he said he had $5 million in the bank. That stuff's easy to find out. I mean, it, it would seem to me, these are not stupid people. Um, they seem to think we are uh, right. most often. But I think a lot of the things he said could have been checked early on. So for them to say they vetted him, uh, I'd say, well, I, I hope you do the rest of the job a lot better than you did that. Because I, I think those things would have been glaring. It, it should have been. You know, As yeah, I said, I, I think the average person could unmask George Santos with five or ten questions. You're listening to this week's Long Island News on the voice of Nassau Community College, 90.3 WHPC. My name is Bill McIntyre, and my guest today is Laura Gillen, former Town of Hempstead supervisor, who is running for Congress as a Democrat in New York's 4th Congressional District in next year's election. Um, there are, um, there's a lot of talk, too, now in, in, about government shutdowns, and I know they're using it as threats. And um, 
what's interesting to me is that there's something in the Constitution that says you cannot not pay your debts. So it, are these government shutdown, uh, I don't know, parties that they've been having, you know, uh, is this theater? I mean, I can't speak for um, the Freedom Caucus and, and what their what their thoughts are about. No, this. I just mean legally. Uh, it, if the Constitution says you can't not pay your bills, I don't care what law somebody passes to say, you know, we're not going to do this, we're not going to do. You have to do that. Well, a government shutdown. We've ha- you know we've had them in the past. It works incredible hardships on a number of people. You know, I have a friend who works for the federal government, and the last time we were going through this, just a couple months ago, she was very concerned about how it was going to impact her family. So, so it's it's a very right. real so threat. There are, there are material bad things that happen to people. Right. I mean. But as funding as, for funding for programs for like mm-hmm. EBT. But now um, how, how can that? I mean, if the Constitution says you can't not pay your bills, how can those things happen? Discretionary enough? spending can be cut. I mean, is this the same? See, this is the other thing that gets me is we need people with political will. They'll say, you know, we have a law against that. You say, well, sure, but unless somebody stands up and points to it and says, I want to invoke that law, nothing gets done. And the law just, you know, flies away like a little bird. So when, you know, a, a politician tells me, you know, we're going to pass a law, I don't really care. I, that, does not, that does nothing for me. Because if you don't have the political will to make sure that that law is followed, what good is that? Well, there's, yes, there's... Th- the a lot law of laws to, on the books. The law has to have teeth. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah. And that comes down to the people that we elect to make sure that those things, you know... That they happen the way they should. Um, let's see. We got. I, let's see on the issue. Okay. Um, I can give you an example of that actually from the town. Go for so it. one of the one of my accomplishments in the town is um, I passed sweeping ethics reform, uh, which was much needed in the town of Hempstead. So we did. We redid the entire ethics code after researching like ethics codes throughout New York State government and even in some other states, and did the most comprehensive ethics reform that you package that you could pass. Again, had to work work across the aisle to get it done, right. but managed to get that done. And um, one of the provisions in our ethics code was. That to try to address nepotism, which cronyism and nepotism are like synonymous with like town of Hempstead government. Everybody knows that, right? right? So I really wanted to try to tackle that. So we had a provision in the ethics code that says you can't supervise your relatives, right? It's just mm-hmm. common sense. I think every corporation in America, nobody's allowed, you're not allowed to supervise your son, your girlfriend, whatever. Yeah, right, right. So after the ethics code got passed, I found out that relatives were supervising each other like a father-in-law was supervising a son-in-law we didn't know they were related because they had different names Mm. so then to address that i put forward a subsequent resolution that anyone who works in the town simply has to disclose who their relatives are that work for the town so we can make sure that the law is being enforced anthony diaspazito and everybody on the town board except for me voted against that because they don't want you to know how many relatives are working in the town Uh, of Hempstead. right but knowing that your relatives and having having it have some consequence those were two different things so you weren't saying if we know who your relatives are we're going to fire everybody of course not Um, of course not i worked for at&t back in the day and there was a company that was fruitful and used nepotism because if you were a good worker they would ask you do you you have a brother you got relatives that and they were, it was a family company, and it was literally made of families. My mother was a phone worker. My uncles worked for AT&T. Um, and that's, that's the way I got in. You know, well, they said, hey, we need good workers. That's um, also private sector versus public sector. So, you, oh, yeah, definitely. Now, I'm just saying that it shouldn't be a disqualification just because you're related. Sometimes the best person for the job is your brother. Sometimes, it, you know, and we should be able to discern that and say, you know what? Yeah, they're related, but this guy has experience in the job. He's, you know, proven good at these things. He would be the best person. So it shouldn't disqualify. There, there was nothing in the code that suggested it would disqualify anybody. Right. It was just so we could enfor- make sure the right. law was being enforced. Right. Yeah. And transparency is very important. That's, I think, the other big problem that we have in the... Uh, I'm not a big fan of internal compliance. Uh, you know, uh, if people are keeping secrets, that's not a good thing. No. that's That was... I mean, I ran on a transparency agenda uh, when I was town supervisor, and I think transparency is very important. Uh, both in terms of 
you know, local government and just transparency about what your personal interests are. Yeah. Um, you know, financial disclosures for elected officials. Mm -hmm. um, there's just a problem because they wouldn't, put, they weren't putting them on, online in the town of Hempstead. When I was there, we did. Right. They were up and they were published in compliance with the code, but they're not, they haven't been adhering to the code. Um, you know, again, yeah. back in town hall, when I was supervisor, I took every town contract. They, they were all paper in filing cabinets. Like if the town of Hempstead town hall burned down, we'd have no copies of our right. contract. Mm -hmm. In yes, that's right. In 2018, they did not scan or digitize anything. I digitized them all and put them all online to let the taxpayers be their own watchdog to see what contracts were being passed. All financial documents had to go online um, and mm -hmm. did a number of things to try to let the sunlight into town hall. Yeah. Well, I, I just thought of something else and we could do a whole nother show on that was the Nassau Coliseum and exactly what happened there yes. and what continues to happen there um you know stadiums are the new way to get public money into private pockets um the ubs is probably a great example of that but i never got to see the books i don't know where the money came from i don't know where it went but i know that uh, you know a hundred ton million tons of concrete is probably pretty expensive so those numbers are probably pretty big uh but anyway we don't have much time left and we've spoken for nearly a half an hour what do you want to say to the people listening uh again i you know I'm running because I really care about this district. I really care about our country. I am the mother of four children. Um, I want to make sure that my children grow up in a place where my daughter will enjoy the same rights that my mother had for most of her life, um, where my children aren't going to be afraid to send their kids to school um, and to send them to the movie theater or send them to church because they might get gunned down. Um, I want to make sure that we're doing the work to bring costs down for people living here and to ameliorate those costs. I also want to make sure that we're doing what we can to harden our infrastructure in terms of uh, environmental concerns, because it's not a question of if, it's just a question of when, of when we have the next Superstorm Sandy. And really, you know, as I said, I, I'm running for office because I want to make things better for the people who live here and for the next generation that's going to live here. I don't have a partisan agenda even going to Congress. I just have a good government agenda. I've proven to the people in this district that that's what I can do, that's what I will do, and that even in a bipartisan world, I can get things done, and that's what I want to do in Congress. Um, have an open mind. I'll be happy to listen to my colleagues on the other side of the aisle. Not No, no side is always right 100% mm -hmm. of the time. Yeah. Um, in my career as a lawyer, I've always had to listen to the other side. I was, I, I'm a litigator, and most of the times, the best thing to do in litigation is to settle the case. So that means working right. with someone who's being paid to disagree with you and finding a way to compromise. And that's what we need more of in Washington, and that's what I want to do. You heard it first. <laughs> but thank you. Thank, thank you very you. much. My guest today has been Ms. Laura Gillen, former town of Hempstead supervisor who is running for Congress as a Democrat in New York's fourth congressional district in next year's election. And again, we want to thank you for taking the time to be here today and speak with us. Good luck on the campaign. Thank you. <laughs> I know it's grueling on you and your family, too, right? Yeah. It's a, it's, it's a lot of work. <laughs> time consuming, sure. Uh, but the clock on the wall says it's time for this week's Long Island News to get on out of here. I'm Bill McIntyre. Remember, you can listen to us by searching for this week's Long Island News wherever, wherever you listen to podcasts. And we're right here on the radio every Friday at 3 p.m. on the voice of Nassau Community College, 90.3 WHPC.